Howdy folks, I'm Keith Bowen and this is Hard Rock University. Today's video is on leaching kinetics. This is more basic information. It's not specific to anything in particular and it applies to more than just leaching. Um, kinetics refers to the speed at which things happen. In this case, how fast do you dissolve, in our circumstances, primarily gold and silver, from rock. Now this depends on a number of factors. One is the leaching chemistry. Now there's different kinds of leaching solutions. They have different characteristics, different costs, different risks. Very, very complicated subject. But no matter what leaching chemistry you're using, you're going to have a couple of other things which will dramatically affect how fast things dissolve. And these are going to be surface area and the Nernst layer. Now, let's do a little demonstration of surface area. First of all, surface area is the only place where the liquid and the solid contact and therefore dissolution can only occur where that happens, i.e. the surface of the solid particle. So, here we have a solid and it has a particular surface area. Now, if we take this solid, and I have ingeniously wrapped a piece of paper around it so that one can see a revelation of the exact surface area. That's the surface area of this solid, which happens to be a deck of playing cards. Now, let's suppose you take this deck of playing cards and you grind it up. This is a, a particle and you grind it up into separate particles. Let's see how much surface area we get. Okay, first interesting observation, my deck of cards was one short. Interesting. Now the white paper in the middle is what I unfolded from the outside the deck. And because that was top and bottom and what you're observing right here is only the top, there's also the bottom underneath, Basically, the ratio is from this card over here to all of that over there. Or in this particular case, it should be 52 to 1 surface area, roughly. And that's what happens when you have smaller particles. This is why when you grind stuff up, it dissolves much faster. Surface area is important, and not just total surface area, but most importantly, the surface area subjected to the solution. So if you have a particle surrounded by rock, like this, no solution can get to it and nothing can dissolve. If you have it partially exposed, then it can dissolve, but it's going to be slower than if it's entirely exposed. So the finer you grind things, everything else being equal, the faster things are going to dissolve. But it gets more complicated and expensive to grind them, and you have to deal with the slimes that are created. The finer the grind, the more the hassles. So there's always a trade-off. But if you're going to be leaching, you want to get the solution to the gold particles, and you want them as exposed as possible in an economical manner. That's always a trade-off. You have to do tests and calculations. Now this works for all situations where a solid is being dissolved in a liquid. The solid would be called the solute. In general, in our case, it would be gold or silver whatever we want. Sometimes it's a, a chemical combination of those with other things. The solvent is whatever the liquid that's doing the dissolving. In our case that would be a leach solution. The blue spots are the individual complex particles, similar to a molecule, of the precious metals in solution. Uh, like gold chloride or whatever. And anyhow, between the bulk solution, whatever this concentration is out here, 
And the particle of solute is something called the Nernst layer. Now again, this works more than just leaching. It's electroplating, a bunch of other things. With, when it comes to surface chemistry, this is a, a fundamental principle. As the solvent gets to the solute, or as the liquid gets to the solid, it starts dissolving, and at the beginning, or the, the boundary, where the solid meets the liquid, you'll have the highest concentration of dissolved particles. And as that gets farther and farther away, that becomes lower and lower concentrations. The area between the surface of the solid and where the concentration reaches that of the bulk liquid is called the Nernst layer. And if this isn't moving very much, that Nernst layer is going to be very concentrated at the surface and it's going to really slow down the solution. Now let me show you this in real life. So here's the setup. What we're trying to do here is demonstrate the uh, effect of surface area and the Nernst layer. So here we have a small quantity of water. These are all the same temperature. Small quantity of water and this is going to go right down in the bottom. That simulates very poor percolation like through a heap leach or a vat leach. All these pieces of salt are the same weight, 2 grams. This one, same weight, but I'm going to drop it in a jar that has a much larger area on the bottom for the salt to dissolve in. This one here, I will hang it in the middle so that as the salt dissolves, it makes the liquid denser, falls away, so it keeps a very gentle circulation going. Here I've made essentially a large tea bag out of screen and have the, uh, the shavings from the other pieces of salt. As you can see, the uh, um, food color has not penetrated too deeply. This is water softener salt briquettes that I broke up. And then here I have one that I'm going to stir so that we're constantly renewing that Nernst layer with fresh solvent. So there we have it. And let me turn on the timer. Start right there. I don't spill any here. And then this one. And you can really see how the higher density liquid just falls and creates a circulation there. So we can see the actual circulation going. Wow. Having a tough time focusing. Then over here on this one, again, let's get it, see if it'll focus. There you go. You can see the dense material circulating downward. There you can see the layer of high density salt solution forming on the bottom which should be a barrier for further dissolution. This one you have something similar but it's more dilute and therefore should dissolve faster. You're going to pretty much going to have to take my word for it, but that is dissolved. Three minutes and 49 seconds, we have complete dissolution of the finely crushed material.
are relatively finely crushed. It's seven minutes. I can still see a little piece of salt in this one where I'm agitating it. And the other chunks are still pretty darn big. 638. So that's uh, 23 minutes, if I calculate that right. And I can't see any left in the tweezers. There's still a chunk of salt down there. And there's still salt in there. It's now 647, or uh, 32 minutes after we started. And this has finally dissolved here, and we still have salt in that one. We'll see how it goes. 8.30, and everything's dissolved except for the last one. Now you can see in this one here, it forms a very distinct layer at the bottom there. I mean, it, it's pretty darn definitive. I knew that would happen. Here it's a little bit more ambiguous. And there we have this one here. Now that's still solid in there. You can still see a solid even though the average bulk solution is not very dark. Let's see. And there it is down there, hoping it'll focus, but it's still solid over two hours later. Here we are about 6.45 the next morning. Finally we've got almost all of the salt dissolved. So basically 12 hours under these circumstances before you get complete dissolution. So you can see just how important the Nernst layer is and how affecting that dramatically changes the speed at which things dissolve. First of all, it only occurs on the surface, so the more you can do to increase the surface area, either by having smaller particles or by getting better exposure of those particles, going to liberation instead of just exposure, you're going to speed things up. Number two, move solution past the solid particles to, to wash away the highly concentrated Nernst layer. Um, agitation, but you notice even gentle movement of solution did not nearly as good, but about half as good as vigorous agitation. Just some kind of continuous movement to keep washing away the dissolved materials and give fresh solution to that will make a big difference. So here we have the three main types of leaching setups that are or have been used in the mining industry. First is the cheapest, the heap leach. You may have heard of this. You take ore, typically you'd crush it to you know, gravel size, pile it up on top of a plastic sheet, sprinkle cyanide solution on it, it hits the plastic sheet, runs out into a collection pond, goes through an extraction process, and comes back. Now using our knowledge, we realize this cannot be very efficient because the particles are poorly broken up, most of the gold is still going to be inside a rock somewhere, and you're going to get some channeling, you know, coarser particles are going to tend to form some zones somewhere that will preferentially allow the solution to go that way and not underneath it. So you'll have some unleached areas in there. This is not very efficient, but it is really cheap. So on low-grade ores, you can do this and actually make money where otherwise you couldn't. Heap leaches, if you get 60% recovery, you're usually fairly happy. Uh, maybe 70% recovery, a little bit better, is about the most you can expect for a standard heap leach operation. But because of the really low costs and the very high volumes, you know, you can process, well, the mine I worked at, we had less than 20 people and we were doing 13,000 tons a day. So, it can be very 
efficient. The next is what I'll call a vat leach. Now this is how they used to do it around the turn of the century and still do it today in some areas because it's very low tech. It's, it's relatively low cost compared to the next step up, but it's not as efficient. And this is where you crush the ore relatively fine. You put it in a container, often just a, a walled opening. You know, like in, in Mexico, I've seen it where walls on three sides and, a, and a, a temporary wall on the fourth, where you could just pull that wall out and wash it out when you were done. The bottom of the vat usually contains a false bottom where you'll put like, like planking with a fabric on top or something like that to act as a filter. You put the leaching solution on top, again typically cyanide because it's so cheap. It comes through the ore, comes back out, goes through extraction and you can recycle that. Now, this has low rates of flow. You have better mineral exposure and mineral liberation, so this will give you better results than a heap leach, but it's not ideal. Again, you have issues. The most efficient is what's known as an agitated tank leach. You have tanks which have some form of agitation. In this case, I've got, you know, agitators, impellers, whatever you want to call them, big propellers at the bottom that stir things up. Uh, you can put a, an air pipe down there, inject air, and it you know, brings things up to the top using what's known as an air dredge. And that would be a Pachuca tank. Same thing. You want agitation. The advantage of a Pachuca tank is also you get good aeration. Oxygen is important to cyanide, so you get really good aeration. And by getting Maximum flow of liquid over the particles. You have rock particles scrubbing any gold particles and grinding off any pacification layers that are forming, things like that. This is your most effective. These will typically be designed to give somewhere in the neighborhood of like 90% recovery. And this is your most efficient. You can also see it also has the highest capital cost per throughput. You've got to have tanks. There's a retention time. So if you're doing a thousand tons a day and it takes two days to process the ore to get, to get the extraction you need, you need to have 2,000 tons of rock in a slurry form, which typically would mean somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 tons of slurry in tanks being stirred at all times using up energy and such. This would be used for higher grade materials and this is the most efficient. But now you know why they're efficient. The particle sizes, particle exposures, you get it. The finer you grind it, the faster things are going to go. And the more you agitate it, the faster things are going to go. Now my next video is going to be some specific suggestions to Nikunj in Tanzania. They're using a vat leech. And some of the videos will be pretty interesting about that because you'll see it's very low tech, lots of hand labor involved, totally different than we would do it over here. But they have constraints here that I'm, I'm trying to see what suggestions I can do to help them improve the situation some. It's not going to be like a, an agitated tank leech in recovery, but maybe we can help them out some. So. There's your three leaching systems. Now you know how they work in general and the basic principles involved. Happy prospecting and keep it safe out there.